<clears throat> Where did the idea that the tablets are curved come from, and why is it seemingly frowned upon? Yeah, th this is a very good point. You know, this uh, Parsha, of course, is the Parsha of the Ten Commandments, the Aserus Adibros. And in every representation, or at least the overwhelming majority of representations, you see two things. The luchos are rounded on the top, and they're connected. They're like one piece of stone. In fact, both of those are incorrect. Uh, number one, the luchos were separated. They were two separate tablets. And number two, they were not rounded, they were rectangular. The luchos are generally rectangular. And indeed, the Gemara Baba Basra explains that the, ten, the commandments were inscribed not only on the front and back surfaces, but even on the sides, even on the thickness of it on the, both, uh, both sides. Top, bottom, really top, bottom, and the two sides. So you actually had six uh, surfaces that had the luchos on them. So the question becomes, now that's very clear from the Gemara in Bava Basra, so we do have a Gemara that discusses it. Uh, so the question becomes, uh, why were the luchos represented as rounded? Um, as, far as, I know, as far as I know, but I'm, I'm going to have to double check this, I don't think there's any mocker in Chazal that supports the roundedness. It really comes from the representations in Christian art. Now, why the Christians made that assumption, I'm not sure. There's no particular theological myla in rounded versus, versus square. But I guess it's the same type of mistake they made with the uh, fruit, right? Every uh, uh, medieval painting of the Garden of Eden has uh, Adam eating an apple, when in fact, although Chazal have many, many different opinions, what the Eitz Hadas was, maybe it was a grape, maybe it was an esrog, maybe it was a fig, uh, maybe it was wheat, a grain. It wasn't even a fruit, it was a growing grain. But as far as I know, there is no opinion in Chazal that says it was an apple. So I guess the same guy who put the apple in the Garden of Eden might have made the luchos rounded. So I, I honestly don't know what the mocker is. I will tell you that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was very mocked, but you know, um, Chabad for many years, I don't know if they still do it, published a children's magazine. And the cover of the children's magazine had you know, the Ten Commandments on the luchos. And uh, he absolutely was mocked uh, that it be squared. And he said that uh, to put it around it would be a misrepresentation of, of Chazal. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a two-part question. So for a Bali Tshuva, does he have to give up a uh, previous hobby which did not conduce to a Torah lifestyle, i.e. movies, uh, video games, secular mu music, uh, sports? Uh, so should he give it up even though it might help him relax and learn Torah better? And the second part is, if he is allowed in a certain Nida, should he hide his activities in the future when he has kids, since his kids will be FFD, and he doesn't want to kind of expose them to that? And if so, how should he? Yeah, these are uh, two very interesting questions, just to repeat for the, for the camera. Uh, the issue of a Baal Shuva, who had certain hobbies, who had certain interests, and the question is, to what degree do you give them up when you become religious, you become observant, you become a student in the yeshiva? And uh, the next question is that even if you can indulge it, indulge in it, but once you're married, you have kids, right? So you're a Balchuva, but your kids are from, from birth, FFB. Uh, should you not kind of engage in whatever your guilty pleasure is uh, with your kids seeing you because they may uh, take up bad habits and it may be a bad influence. So in a general way, I just want to point out the following. And uh, we've, you know, I've, talking, I've spoken about this before, you know, every year, uh, in the summer, on, on Shiva Serbatamas. Mm. Or Sameach has an all-day Kirov seminar. I don't know if any of you have ever gone there. You know, people speak literally all day on different topics about Jewish outreach. So, you know, I'm one of the speakers. There are many before me and many after me as well. Uh, but one of the things I talk about is exactly this particular issue. Uh, and obviously, the process of becoming religious means there are going to be certain aspects of your prior life that you're going to have to give up. I mean, if you were a strip dancer in a nightclub, you know, it's one of those things you're not going to do. But, but there is a real problem in giving up too much because, in a sense, you're amputating yourself. You know, if you've developed in your life certain talents and certain interests, whether it be music, whether it be art, whether it be writing, whether it be painting, and the like, and then you say, well, that's not yeshivasha enough. It's not Torah enough. I got to, you know, change and, and be a totally different person. That could create a lot of depression. 
And really, it's like amputation. I mean, what are you going to say? I'm going to cut off my arm. Uh, now, it's true that sometimes amputation is medically necessary. But it's a last resort. It is not a first resort. So as a general rule, those things that give you joy and those things that give you satisfaction, those things that foster your creativity, you try to find ways within Judaism to keep them alive. Now, find ways within Judaism does mean at a minimum that it not violate Jewish law, it not violate halacha, right? But, but nevertheless, most of the time, uh, I mean, you can even see it here in Arsameach. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess I can mention a name because it's, it's open. Rabbi Sinclair has a, has a band, right? He has a band uh, in Arsameach. Now, uh, sometimes the music they play might not be standard yeshiva, you know, uh, Avram Fried uh, songs. Some of it is based on uh, rock or other types of modern music. But they try to incorporate it in a framework in which it is consistent with Torah values and the like. So, in, so instead of a tshuva that is an amputation tshuva, in which you destroy yourself, this is a tshuva in which you take those good parts of your past and you kind of assimilate it within a Jewish or a Torah framework. And, they, and as I say, uh, it's a well, well, I don't know if it's well known, but there's a certain phenomenon in, in the yeshiva world, not only the Baal world, the whole yeshiva world, in which there's a certain, what you might call, subclinical depression, sometimes clinical depression, but at a minimum, subclinical. People, people are often sad. Now, why are people sad? They're engaged in learning of Torah. Learning of Torah should be the most joyous of all activities. Why, why would somebody be sad? Well, I'll give you a few, I'll give you two reasons why people might be sad. One, one reason why people might be sad is that the standard of successful accomplishment is so beyond what any of us will be able to do that by definition we're all failures. So uh, who are our role models? Yeah, our role models are, you know, Rav Avadji Yosef, Rav, Rav Yoshev, Rav Chaim Kenevsky. Well, you know, we could sit and learn a million years and, you know, we're not going to reach that level. So one problem is that the models of success are so phenomenally great that by definition will be mediocre no matter what. Now that's not really true because Hashem judges you by how much effort you put in. But at least in terms of psychological understanding, we all feel very inferior. That, that's one aspect. But another aspect is that in the yeshiva world, there's a tremendous pressure on you to give up things that are outside of the narrow framework of yeshiva. Don't play that musical instrument because that's goyish. Right? Don't uh, do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. You dare not do that. Well, what happens is, if a person is constantly repressing things that they really did enjoy and were meaningful to them, well, that repression turns inward and it creates a lot of depression and a lot of sadness. Now, the problem with that is, depression and sadness also affect your avodah Hashem. They affect your learning. They affect your davening. They affect your ability to have a relationship, shalom bias, uh, and becoming a parent. So as a result, I do think as a general uh, matter, you should not really try to move away that much from the things that you enjoy, but it may take a great deal of creativity as to how you adapt them to within the framework of Torah. Now, we can actually see that many, many Bali Tshuva, uh, who were musicians in their former lives, you know, some, some of them were actually... Um, you know, usually backups. We really don't have that many stars, but you know, people who were backup musicians to really rock stars and the like, and they found ways of continuing this in a more kosher way. Uh, even women who were singers, you know, so now there's an issue of Kolisha, but they've managed to uh, sing to all women's audiences and the like. Sports certainly, you know, uh, is very, very positive. Not so much spectator sports. Watching sports may not be a tremendous thing, but playing sports is good for your health. It helps you in, uh, in Avodah Sashem, right? So I'm not going to be against that. Now, you mentioned some of your examples, you know, are going to be controversial. I, I don't know. Hate mail, please. Uh, the issue of movies. Now, movies, I'm, I am not going to give you a psak on movies, and I'll probably be criticized for that. Uh, talk to your local rabbi. Oh, is that me? Okay, but talk to your local <laughs> rabbi uh, about, about that particular issue. A lot of movies are treif. A lot of movies are usher. Some movies might, might be permitted. So I can't give you a carte blanche for every single activity that you did before, but as a general rule, you try to incorporate as much as you can 
to the extent that you consider it to be positive, that it's nurturing you, it, it fosters creativity. Now, the second part of your question is really interesting. Uh, what do you do about your kids? Now, it's so fascinating. And, and in, a way, in a way, it's kind of funny. Uh, because many, many Balei Tshuva uh, were raised uh, with popular culture. And I'm not necessarily talking about anything sinister. I'm not talking about drugs or anything like that. But you know, whatever they watched, I'm dating myself, they watched the Three Stooges, or they watched Abbott and Costello. And sometimes they'll even use uh, something from Abbott and Costello, like Who's on First is a, is a famous one, to make a cure of point. Right? They'll say, oh, yeah, everyone knows. Who, you know. And yet, and yet, they don't want their kids to be exposed to it because it's treif, it's negative. Well, how treif is it, really, if in point of fact, the Balchuva incorporated it in his own teaching to other Balei Tshuva. And in a sense, again, I'm getting, this is going to be a little controversial, in some ways, you know, not exposing your kids to those things might make them more focused. But it may deprive them of a certain richness and a certain understanding of life that you're able to have because of your background that they're not going to have. Again, it's a strange idea. We tend to look at those of us who were born in non-religious environments like we're laboring under a disadvantage. Like, you know, we're, you know, we're kind of damaged goods, we're kind of failures, as opposed to my kids who were raised from. Okay, you know, there is that idea that obviously there were things that some of us didn't have growing up that we can feel a little bad about. But you know, the fact that the person who didn't have the experiences you had may be at a certain disadvantage as well. So here's the thing. Uh, I can look at a Meya Sharim Jew that's 10 generations or 50 generations of rabbis. And I can say, wow, that is so great. I can never be that. And that's true. But it's also true that the guy who comes from South Dakota or Alabama has things that the Meya Sharim person will never have. God puts your soul where it has to be. You know, you didn't make a choice. I'm just using examples to be in South Dakota or Alabama. God put you there. Now, you may ask the question, why did God put me there? Why didn't God put me in Meisharim? God's not fair. The answer is no. God is fair. You needed the Alabama experience. You needed South Dakota in your Yiddishkeit. So as a result, you see the, the almost nonsensical idea of saying, now that I'm from, I'm forgetting all of that. Well, why did God put you there? That means the first 20 years of your life were just a waste. The answer is no, they're not a waste. You get things from there that's going to build you up as a Jew in your unique way of Avodah Hashem. So how you raise your kid is actually a difficult, a kind of a difficult question. But I think by and large you can be kind of open about your life. And uh, there might be good things that you can bring to your kids that they won't get in the framework of a totally exclusive religious education. Um, I'll give you one little example about this. And again, I'm, I'm being marich a little bit because it, it's important enough that I, that I want to talk about it a little longer. Um, you know, the Roshiva of Mir, the former Roshiva of Mir, of Nassim Svi Finkel, Zechron of Racha. Now, he came from an Orthodox family. That, that's, he's, not, he's not a Balshuva per se. But he came from a, uh, he, he grew up in Chicago. And uh, he went, and everyone knows the story at least, uh, he went to a co-ed Jewish high school. And he was on the basketball team, and he had a girlfriend, you know, he was on the debating team. And then uh, when he came to Eretz Yisrael in Mir, because his great uncle was the Rashiva of Mir, so he did have a chash of a family. Mm -hmm. So he had never learned Torah for more than an hour at a time. There was no such thing. So he had to learn like three hours or four hours morning Seder, which was totally exhausting to him. And then afterwards, he asked his chavrusa, so what do you guys do in the afternoon here? Figuring, OK, you have a rough like nine to one schedule. And then the rest of the day, you know, touring or whatever it is. And when they said, well, we, we learn again, <laughs> he says he couldn't believe it, it you know. And um, so when he died, he, you know, as you know, he had, mul he had uh, was it multiple sclerosis or what, what was it? Uh, he had a debilitating disease, Parkinson's, I'm sorry, Parkinson's, yeah. And uh, he was very, very seriously ill, but he went on. He was amazing, his mysterious nefesh. And he went on uh, traveling and raising money and learning and giving shiurim, just unbelievable in terms of his devotion. And he died very suddenly although he had been sick for many, many years. So I remember going to the eulogies, going to the Hespedim. And all of the Hespedim kind of made the same point. 
and that is the man came from such tumor, the man came from such decadence, the man came from such a bad environment, and look at what you can become. The whole lesson was he transcended his environment. He managed to escape his environment. Right? That was the message. Chicago, co-ed, trafe, no good. And look at the greatness of a person who could escape that environment. Well, I was a little offended because I came from an environment like that. I mean, I went to a co-ed school and, you know, maybe I wouldn't send my son to a co-ed school, but, you know, it wasn't the biggest tragedy in the world. I mean, uh, there was a lot that I gained from that school. I still remember some of the f greatest Rebbies I ever had. I rally from, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. I still very much remember them. So I would suggest maybe, as an outlier, I, I would suggest the following idea. Rav Nassim Finkel's greatness was not only that he escaped his environment, but that he was connected to that environment even as he transitioned to become a great Rosh Hashiva. You know, one of his great points was that he had a, an ability to relate to kids at all levels. So when you had, you know, kids who came from modern Orthodox schools, kids who were not even fully Shomer Shabbos, and they would come to the Mir Yeshiva on some Israel trip, and they would sit next to a man with a long beard. And of course, they figured he has nothing to say to them. He probably doesn't even know English. And then he starts talking about jump shots and, and basketball and all sorts of things. They were amazed. And then they understood that, you know, you can play basketball and know about the three-point shots and jump shots and still be totally connected to Torah. In other words, he didn't attempt to deny his background. He said, yeah, I know all that stuff. So to me, it was much greater that he connected to that background and brought it into his life, and that gave him a certain ability to influence people. Now, I know another person, I'm not going to mention him, also a very eminent Rosh Hashiva, who kind of whitewashed his background. Like, he kind of rewrote his life, rewrote his biography. You know, he came from a very modern environment with everything else, but now it's all, you know. In fact, this person has a sister that sometimes asks me, Shalos, and she's actually enraged because when their mother died, he was portraying her as a Haredi woman of Mea Sharem type. <laughs> My mother was a Zionist, or <laughs> whatever, whatever it would be. So this is an idea where somebody, and again, this is an eminent person, a chash of a person, a person who has many Talmidim, who's done a lot of good, he felt that in order to make his mark, he needed to kind of become somebody else. Okay, I, I mean, I hear it. But uh, Rav Nassim Svi Finkel, Bedavka, never became somebody else. And I think that, to me, that's kind of a role model for where you need to go. So forgive me for the arichus, but that's uh, what I wanted to share. Yeah. So uh, considering a person who is considered uh, brain dead, Mm. Just to clarify, like, well, let's say it's someone whose brain stem isn't functioning. So the only way that their heart is beating is from a ventilator. Um, when would they be considered halakhically dead? And is there any point at which doctors would be considered to be prolonging the process of death unnecessarily? Yeah. yeah, this is a very excellent question about brain death and when is a person brain dead? And I, I know by your question that you are familiar with the definitions of the terms, but I need to, to elaborate a little bit. Uh, brain dead is a, is a term that both has a popular meaning and a medical meaning, and the medical meaning is not the same as the popular meaning. People often say, oh, anybody in a coma, anybody unconscious who cannot be pulled out of it is brain dead. Uh, that's not really true. If a person is unconscious, they, they lack consciousness but their brain stem that controls respiration, breathing, is still intact. And therefore, many people on a coma don't need a respirator. They're, they're capable of breathing, uh, even though they have to be fed intravenously because you know, they're not taking nutrition by mouth. Now, it's very, very clear that even if a person is comatose, even if a person lacks you know, intelligent brain function, but the brain stem is still there, that person is 100% alive, and if you were to remove an organ or a heart 
from a person in a coma, you would be guilty of murder. And that's not only true halachically, that is even true legally. You cannot take an organ from somebody whose brain stem is still functioning. That person is alive. Now, there is, however, something further beyond coma, and that is destruction of the brain stem, meaning the brain stem has been destroyed usually through an automobile accident or some type of traumatic injury. And this is determined by all sorts of neurological tests. For example, uh, you shine a light in the person's eyes and the pupils do not contract. You jab a needle. There are no reflexes. So a brainstem person, by definition, is not capable of their own respiration because respiration is controlled by the brain stem. So what happens is this. What happens is you supply oxygen by a machine called a respirator or a ventilator. Now, here is the thing. The heart is not directly controlled by the brain, uh, or at least there's an emergency system. The heart has its own internal pacemaker. And that is why, even after a person stops breathing, the heart muscle could continue to function as long as oxygen is being delivered. So brain death means a neurological diagnosis of the brain stem not functioning. Oxygen is being supplied uh, totally mechanically, 100% level, meaning there's 0% breathing on his own. But the heart, as long as it's getting that oxygen, continues to uh, beat on its own. Not, not, and, uh, you don't need a machine for that. The heart is beating on its own, and there's circulation of blood, and there's body temperature. That is a phenomenon that is called brain death, or sometimes it is called whole, whole brain death, or brain stem death, and the like. Now, brain stem death is very different than a coma. A person could be in a coma for 20 years. Brain stem death is not a long-term situation. Uh, from a diagnosis of brain stem death till cardiac arrest is no more than six months, meaning you can't be brain dead for five years. But you can be brain dead for up to six months because the heart kind of has its own thing for up to six months and then it just does the cardiac arrest. So the major halachic issue, oh, sorry. so legally, legally, brain stem death in the United States is legal death in all 50 states, in all 50 states, which means a person can be declared dead on the basis of brain death, even though they're on a respirator and the heart is beating, which means he could be disconnected from the respirator legally, he could be buried, put into the ground, and they can also cut into him, if the family authorized it, and take out his heart, and that's not considered murder. And they have to do it then, because if they wait until cardiac arrest, the heart muscle deteriorates. So all heart transplantation, or most, most heart transplantation presupposes brain death. Because if you waited until cardiac death, you couldn't do it. So the big halachic question is, does halacha recognize brain stem death as halachic death? And the most important nafkamina is, what does halacha say about heart transplants? Because if halacha says a brain stem dead person is halachically dead, we would then be allowed to remove the heart for transplantation. If, on the other hand, halacha says as long as the heart is beating and blood is circulating, the person is alive, removal of the heart would be an act of murder. And you cannot kill one person to save another person. So this is a very big question. Does halacha permit heart transplantation? So the short answer is, uh, this is a huge, huge machlokas. I would have to say, honestly, that most poskim do not validate brainstem death, and they do not permit removal of a vital organ, because they say the person is either halachically alive because the heart is beating, or at least we're not sure if the diagnosis is accurate, so we, can't take it, we cannot take a chance that we're murdering somebody. However, uh, particularly in the modern Orthodox community, there has, among Rabbanim, there has been an acceptance of brainstem death, and many will allow heart transplantation, and even say that it is a mitzvah. 
Uh, the biggest proponent of this was a person who just died a few months ago, uh, Rabbi Moshe Tendler, uh, who was both a, a very chash of a rav and a professor of biology at YU. And he was the son-in-law of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Uh, Rav, and uh, he was a very strong proponent uh, that halacha does accept brainstem death and organ donation is a mitzvah. So that was his view. He claimed that was Rav Moshe Feinstein's view as well, although you know, he doesn't really have a lot of proof of that other than, you know, well, he says personal, but you know, whatever, that's, it's hard to know. Uh, but I have to say that most uh, post do not agree. Now, if you're interested, I, I actually have two articles on organ donation, but if you check, there's a website called Halachic Organ Donor Society. And I, I'm of two minds of the website. I'll tell you why, because the website is an advocacy website, meaning the, 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 the one who created the site is pushing for organ donation by summarizing all of the halachic positions that would allow it. So on one hand, he very definitely has an agenda, which I don't agree with because it's connected to Postkim. On the other hand, he does bring all the sources on both sides. So if you ignore his particular push, you can actually examine a lot of very good source material on it. So he is even-handed in his presentation, although he is pushing for a particular result. So it is a very, very major controversy. Can you say that name one more time? Yeah, the name of, yeah. Halachic Organ Donor Society. It might be abbreviated HODS. I believe the, the, the website is HODS.org. Yeah. Um, growing up in America, um, organ donation was not really something that everyone speaks about is Abraham Lincoln's uh, screen slaves. And in, in, in the Torah, there's a the concept of that having an Abbot Kanani, and one's not really high to sustain him well, and one's not necessarily to treat him very, very well, which, was, which seems to be like how the South was before Lincoln. Um, how, 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 does one, how does one person who grew up in America in the secular world appreciate the concept of an Abbot Kanani? And especially, and it's very difficult because of the, the fact that it's they want you to free him, etc. Yeah, the issue of uh, slavery in the Torah is actually a very, very difficult, difficult issue for us uh, because, you know, uh, we're used to the idea that slavery is evil. Treating human beings like property is a very bad thing. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, regarded as the uh, greatest president in, in, every, in every single listing of presidents of the United States, Lincoln is number one. I mean, Trump wanted to say at one point that he should be number one above Lincoln, but you know, okay. I mean, I like, I like Trump as a president, but I think you know, above Lincoln is a little bit uh, you know, too much. Uh, and, uh, and, yet, and yet, we look at Hashem's Torah that we believe is from HaKadosh Baruch and the Kaddish Baruch talks about slavery. Now, just to explain this a little bit, we have Eved Ivri, Jewish slave, Eved Kanani. Now, Eved Ivri is not really a problem. Number one, the Eved Ivri is a limited term, six years. And uh, if he wants to extend it, it only goes to the Jubilee year, which might be a long time, but it might be a short time, whenever Yovel is. But besides that, even during the years that he's a slave, Chazal say, he who buys an Eved Ivri has bought a master. You have to give him the best bed in the house, the best food in the house. You can't make him do a job that he's not trained for if he's a lawyer. <laughs> for whatever reason, then he has to do law, you can't make him mow the lawn, right? So we don't even have to call that slavery because that's, that's not really connected to slavery. On the other hand, we do have the other type of Ebed, which is Eved Kanani, which just means a non-Jewish Ebed, Labdafka, a Canaanite Ebed. And an Ebed Kanani seems to be slavery, like the slaves uh, of Africa, uh, in which um, he's a slave forever, and even if the master dies, you know, the heirs inherit uh, the slave. Uh, you're not supposed to free him, etc. He can be ordered to do any type of work you want him to do and the like. So if we're dealing with slavery, like how could the Torah allow slavery? Is that, that seems to be inhumane. So there are a few approaches to this. Uh, one approach is that uh, the Torah does not necessarily encourage slavery. Rather, slavery was a pre-existing institution that existed in the ancient world. And sometimes the Torah didn't want to <coughs> abolish something because it would have been too much to go cold turkey. So instead, the Torah creates a system 
which at least avoids the brutality of slavery. So for example, you're not allowed to abuse a slave. That's, remember, that's the halacha, that if you knock out a slave's eye or tooth, the slave goes free. In a more broad sense, that prevents really serious abuses. So one way of looking at it is, the Torah does not validate slavery, the Torah tolerates slavery by providing it in a more humane form. And it's somewhat similar, just to give you an analogy, to what the Rambam says about korbanos. Remember what the Rambam says about korbanos? He says, God doesn't want korbanos. He doesn't need barbecue meat. But Elamai, the, Jew, the Jewish people were so attracted to the idolatrous rituals of korban, if God were to say, don't do it, they wouldn't be able to separate from idolatry. So God said, okay, I'll let you do it, but do it this way. So slavery in that way would be very similar. But I'll tell you, I have a problem with that. I hear that explanation, but my problem is this. If you're telling me that slavery is really bad, but the Torah didn't want to go cold turkey because people wouldn't accept it, so it gave you a more humanized slavery, then wouldn't it stand to reason that it would be better to free your slaves than not? In other words, we would basically say, yeah, okay, uh, if you're really a righteous person, free your of it. Right? That would be the logic of this position. And yet, Chazal say, you're not supposed to free your Evid Kanani. Anyone that frees his Evid Kanani transgresses a positive commandment because the Torah says, Li olam bahem tavodu, you shall enslave them forever. Remember the famous case, Rabbi Eliezer walked into Shul and he was the ninth guy and he walked in with his Evid. So there's only nine people and Evid doesn't count for a minion. So he freed his Evid. So who then becomes a regular Jew. And the Gemara even asks, how can he free his Evid? You're not allowed to free your Evid. And the Gemara says, well, for a special mitzvah you could, like an exception. Free your Evid, that's a major economic forfeiture. I mean, it's like, it's like paying like $100,000 to make a minion. I mean, it's, he, he, gave, he gave up a big economic investment. So the question is, if you go with the argument that slavery is something that is tolerated but not desirable, then why would there be a prohibition against freeing an Evid? For Kert, I would have said, that's a good thing to do. That's a kasha on that explanation. Now, there is an alternative explanation, which is not politically correct. Uh, so people, uh, you know, liberal Jews or liberal people might not accept it. But that is, slavery, at least when it's humanized and non-abusive, actually served a positive function because it kind of took the uncivilized pagans who were guilty of murder and human sacrifice and put them in a Jewish environment of morality and uh, ethics, and it kind of trained them. It tamed them. It was taking the, the beasts, so to speak, and making them more human. Uh, now, this is a theory of slavery that was advanced by none other than Aristotle when he explained the Greeks taking slaves. And not that the Torah is based on Aristotle, but it could be that in the Torah there was a similar idea that you're doing the Canaanites a favor by bringing them in a kind of more moral environment than the environment they came from. Now, that only works, of course, right? That only works if you're talking about a Torah environment, meaning it wouldn't be a validation of slavery where the slave owners are immoral and not following things, right? But where the slave owner himself is a moral, ethical person, then there might be some benefit to the slave. And indeed, um, well, okay, I mean, uh, as they say, uh, many, many modern people might find that profoundly offensive, but, but that, doesn't mean it's not, that doesn't mean it's not true. I mean, there, there still may be some truth to this idea. So these are kind of the two arguments that you have. Uh, one is the Torah tolerates but doesn't encourage. The other is this was a means of civilizing savages and bringing them to a better place. Yeah. Uh, here's a send in. Does a double amputee have to keep the laws of Sneas for their prosthetic legs? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Oh, again, it's not, it's not a funny situation. Uh, God, you know, it's a tragic situation. But uh, as I'm referring, the question is for a woman, you mean, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question would be if, God forbid, uh, a woman is a double amputee and has a prosthetic uh, leg or legs, uh, are there halachos of 
tsneos in terms of covering up artificial limbs, uh, which would, of course, certainly this would apply had it been a real leg, but it's not a real, real leg. Uh, that is a very interesting question, and I, and I cannot say I have a definite answer to that. Uh, I think in terms of actual halachas of tsneos, uh, it would not have to be covered, but, but there is an aspect of tsneos that if something is lamaisa, sexually provocative or alluring, then at least uh, men should avoid looking at it. I mean, let, let me give you a simple example. Let's take a picture. Let's just take a picture. Is there anything halakhically wrong with my looking at a picture of a naked woman? For me to look at an actual naked woman, that's an isra of histoclis benashim. Okay, that is usr. Uh, but is there an isra if I'm looking at a picture, or a video for that matter? So interestingly enough, from the standpoint of actual halacha, just black letter halacha, a picture is not the same as the real thing. So one could argue that a prosthetic is similar to a picture. It's not, it's not the real leg. Nevertheless, uh, every rub will tell you that if lamaisa, uh, something is sexually alluring or arousing, then it's proper for me to avoid it, even if it's not mamish, histaklis benashim. So I think a prosthesis would be the same way. Now, you know, it depends. In other words, if, if it's clearly a prosthetic limb, so probably, uh, you know, it's not, not going to be sexually arousing in any way. But if it mamash looks like a, a real thing, then I think, uh, although mitzad the halacha, there wouldn't be a problem. It uh, should be improper because of hirhor, as well as, from her perspective, marasayan. If, because if people don't know it's a prosthesis, then bichlal it's going to be a marasayan problem anyway. Yeah. So uh, the Gemara in Brachos, you know, Lamed Zayin and Aleph, talks about how um, Oras and Dochan, there's a price that says Oras and Dochan are, um, Oras and Dochan bread, you say a Mizonos on them, and it's, a, or it's well, the Brisa says it's like my Gedera, and then there's another Brisa that says my Gedera, you say Mizonos on that. But then the Teretz of the Gemara is, well, you know, when the Bryce has said they're like the Maise Gadera, it's they're like the Maise Gadera in that you need to make a bracha before and after, but they're not like the Maise Gadera because you need it, you only say shackle and brain of fashos on them. So my question basically is, doesn't everything need a bracha on it as it was established a couple of daf earlier in brachos? And therefore, what would be like the, like, what, what is this Terence? I mean, what's the Kiddush though, that it's like Maise Gadera? If it only means you have to say a bracha, then you don't have to call it maisa kadeira. It would apply to every type of food. Uh, I'm going to have to look. I, 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 hear, I hear the question. It's a good kasha, but I, I'm going to have to look at the Gemara inside. I will try to look at it. Yeah. The, the concept of um, Ein Shaliyah, uh, the Dvar uh, Avera, yeah. has some, it seems to have some peculiar implications, such as the fact that someone hires a hitman to kill someone. Yeah. Only the hitman is punished and the one who's contracting it? Yep. It, so, what seemed would, um, take the example of the Nazis and Hitler, Yamak Shemo, who never physically killed anyone. If he were before a Beit Dean, what would be his <laughs> Wow. And he probably would, instead of saying, I'm not, I was just following orders, he would just say, I was just giving orders. You know? <laughs> the, the other way around. <laughs> and, then, and on that, was it also halakhically permissible? for um, the state of Israel to kill Eichmann. And in, in that, would the judges be considered a Beit Deen, since there's three? Um, like, for example, I've heard of uh, situations where young kids are like playing around and they accidentally marry each other. Like, can you accidentally create a Beit Deen by having three <laughs> judges? Yeah, and yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, basically, that's my, my question. Yeah, these are all very, very interesting questions. I, I, I know from uh, another email I got today that you're learning the, yeah, you're, you're learning the big sugya of Ein Shaliyach Ledvar Veira. This is one of the great, great sugyas and shas that there's no concept of agency when it comes to an Aveira because the Shaliyach should not have listened. Now, this creates some very, very strange, and you're just repeating your point, this creates some really, really strange counterintuitive rules, and that is I hire you to kill somebody and you carry out my instructions 
oh, I can then just throw you under the bus. Hey, you, you shouldn't have listened to me, and uh, you're going to get the death penalty. Nothing happens to me. I, I gave the order. Now, that's strange enough, even if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, just you know, one guy killing one guy. <laughs> but then you extrapolate it uh, to Hitler, right? Hey, I ordered six million people to be killed. But, hey, you know, nobody should have listened to me, and uh, <laughs> I'm not responsible for anything. I mean, Hitler can say, I never killed a Jew in my life, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's really, really strange that the one who is the cause of millions of people dying uh, is going to be off the hook because of the principle of Ein Sholiach Lidvara Veira. So first of all, let me make the point that, uh, number one, the Gemara in Kedushin, at least, makes it very, very clear that this is only an exemption in terms of a based in punishing, meaning a basin is not going to punish the hitman. In God's heavenly book, that person is treated as a murderer, and therefore, you know, Hitler, is, Hitler will certainly not escape, or did, or did not escape, the divine punishments for such a vicious. That's one thing to keep in mind. But still, still, the bottom line seems to be that in terms of a punishment be day adam, uh, you have a taina of ancient Vara So here, there is a passage in the Rambam that I think uh, is going to be helpful. And the Rambam basically says that although it's true that there's a rule of ancient Vara but the Rambam says there's kind of like an emergency martial law exception to this. Uh, and a lot of things. In fact, generally speaking, in fact, the Rambam says this in a more general context. The laws of capital punishment in halacha are very difficult to apply because you have to have two eyewitnesses and they have to warn the guy and the guy has to acknowledge the warning. In other words, the murderer gets off the, even the direct murderer gets off the hook all the time. So what's going to stop people from just killing with impunity because they're not going to be punished? So the Rambam says that the basin can suspend all of these rules of evidence uh, when there's a social breakdown. And uh, they could also kill the uh, the hit uh, the uh, one who hired the hitman. So there are there are within the system ways that some of these rules can be uh, suspended. Let me also point out, although this wouldn't be relevant to a trial afterwards, you have to differentiate punishment for mur for murder versus the laws of Rodef, meaning the following: Hitler certainly could have been killed during the war to prevent further orders from being carried out. Because that's the halacha of Rodef. And Rodef does not, do, does not require that you're only killing the direct perpetrator. For Kert, the Iker Rodef might be the mastermind. The only thing is, Rodef would allow Hitler being killed during the war. It would not necessarily allow to kill him once he's been apprehended and disabled. By the way, I think I mentioned the story before. Um, my, uh, I had an aunt, Zichron uh, Racha who was able to pass as a Gentile during World War II. And she actually worked for an SS. She had a four-year-old, my cousin, she had a four-year-old uh, boy. My older cousin is not alive anymore. And they passed themselves off as uh, Goyim, as Gentiles. And she worked uh, for a Gestapo officer. And she was the cook and everything else. And she had her four-year-old with her. And you know, she was terrified that they would see that he had a bris. I, I mean, just, just imagine, like, every single night there was this great fear that she would be discovered. So, as they say, guess who's coming to dinner? So one night, uh, Adolf Hitler came to dinner. And she was serving Adolf Hitler. And she said she was close enough to him that she could have stabbed him in the heart. And she was debating to herself, should she kill him? Should she kill him? She decided, I mean, just, just un unbelievable, she decided not to because if she would kill him, she, of course, would be immediately killed. And what would happen to, what would, what would happen to her son, etc.? So she decided she did, could not, did not want to get her son killed or tortured or, or whatever it is. And, there's, and as you know, there were several assassinations. Even among Nazis, there were Nazis who wanted to assassinate Hitler. There were several assassination attempts against Hitler that were unsuccessful. But historians speculate, this, this is a very interesting question, if Hitler would have been killed in the middle of the war, would that have stopped the Holocaust or would, or would that have accelerated the Holocaust? It's not a Dover Pushet that killing Hitler per se would have saved all of these Jewish lives. Because remember, Hitler had a lot of fanatical followers. 
uh, I mean, you had Goering and Himmler and all, all, all these guys, and these guys might have said, particularly if a Jew killed Hitler, they might have used it as an excuse to even create a greater genocide. So it's, it's, it is tricky. But be it as it may, Rodef theoretically would be available, but that wouldn't answer an after the fact. Now, uh, the issue of, Ein, of Eichmann. So Eichmann certainly could have been killed during the war if that would have stopped it. After the war, uh, so the question becomes, uh, well, once again, but putting that aside, uh, the issue is, is the Israeli courts that tried Eichmann, could they qualify as a basedin? Well, I'll tell you a few problems. First of all, for Dine Nefashos, for capital crimes, you need a basin of 23, not, not three. So you, you don't have the right number. Second of all, there are requirements for being a basedin, such as being Torah observant and the like, and uh, the judges there did not, uh, did not uh, qualify. So I don't think you could look at the Eichmann trial as a regular capital punishment trial. On the other hand, uh, it might qualify as a Noahide court, which may have its own, own powers, right? So uh, I think most people, even Polskim, would legitimate the killing of, of Eichmann. Yeah? Um, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the bracha on Kaling uh, is the only one that I know that you can say Kli or Kaling. I mean, when you when you when you when you when you take it to the mikvah, you mean? Yeah. 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 Oh, in other words, why, why, in other words, why do you why do you change the nusach depending on whether you're tovel one thing or tovel two things, right? Tovel yeah. one thing, yeah. it's tovilas kli. When you're told well, more than one thing, it's to be less kalim. So you're asking Akasha, like, why do you look at the specifics of what you're doing? I mean, you're making a bracha on the mitzvah. The mitzvah in the Torah is to be tovel stuff. So why would you have to change it based on the particular thing that you're doing? That, that is a good kasha. I, I have to think about that, that as well. Uh, because normally we would not change the nusach of a bracha based on the particulars of what you're doing. We look at the bracha in a more general way. Um, let, me, let me think about it some more. It's a, it's a good question. Are there, yeah. Other, are there any other brachas that uh, follow, like have that distinction? You know, I, I don't think there is. That, 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 that strengthens your, your point. That's the only one. Yeah. So I got into a discussion with someone on, uh, let's say there's a guy who's kind of, in the, he's like, you're not sure if he's quote unquote interested in Judaism or not, but like, you know, he's around or some or whatever. And he asks about like something controversial that like doesn't necessarily go with the popular opinion. Uh, the debate was, do you, what, what do you say to him? Do you say to him, uh, like, I'm not gonna answer you just because, you know, he might be asking, uh, you know, kind of like as a, I guess, you know, as in Pesach, like, he's, he's kind of like the, the, evil, the evil child. Like, he's, he's only <laughs> asking me this because he wants a reason to kind of, like, turn away. He's, he's being, like, uh, annoying. Or do you say, or do you answer him uh, because it's a suffix on whether or not he's actually asking to try to get, like, a true answer? Uh, yeah. Granted, part of the response of, for the first answer is, well, if all you do is every time a controversial opinion comes up is avoid the avoid giving a response, then he's gonna say, ah, oh, all these people, they're just Christians. They never they never tell me what uh, you know. They never want to answer these big questions. They're 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 no better than Christians. So how do you? What is like the proper response when you're dealing with someone you don't necessarily know where they're coming? Yeah, from? Yeah, you know, it's it's a good question, and I think it may come up more often here than maybe some other places because we have. You know, people wandering in off the streets uh, thinking that our Sameach has the answers to every question in life uh, that, that exists. Uh, let me start with saying there are two psukim in Mishlei. Mishlei is the book of Proverbs, and it is the book of Shlomo HaMelech's wisdom. And there are two psukim that are directly contradict each other. One is, answer a fool according to his foolishness. And the other pasuk says, don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, lest you be foolish as well. 
So what do you do? Do you answer? Don't you answer? The answer is, sometimes you answer, sometimes not. And the Shlomo HaMelech is Marame's exactly your situation, that sometimes dialogue is constructive, and sometimes there's not really a good point in doing it, and it can even be not only a waste of time, but can be negative to you as well. And I think you hit upon a very, very important idea, and that is, if somebody genuinely wants to know, and they're open, and they want to understand, then there's certainly a mitzvah to communicate with them, no matter how preposterous the question is. Somebody, now, now, now maybe you don't have the information, then you have to refer them to somebody else, but, but in terms of giving him an avenue where he can express his questions and have them discussed, whether it's with you or whether it's with somebody else, is a very, very good thing and a proper thing that people need to have places, uh, resources, where they can bring up questions. Even if somebody says, how do I know there's God? Now, if he genuinely wants to know, then you know, we try to find some way in which this can be discussed. On the other hand, you are 100% correct that there's a certain modality where the so-called question does not have a question mark at the end of the sentence. The question has an exclamation point. You're not asking a question you're giving an answer. You're making a statement. You want to pontificate. Well, it's a free country, so you have the right to pontificate. That's fine. But I have the right not to listen. I, mean, in other words, I don't have to listen to your pontification if it's not of interest to me or I feel it'll be detrimental to me. So again, you can do what you want. And there are enough atheists out there that you can form your club or, or whatever it is. So, so the question, because, so, I, I, so I think the distinction is clear. The question is, how do I know whether a given person falls on one side of the equation or the, or the other side? Um, I don't have a clear answer. You have to have your gut reaction there. Uh, I, I would be inclined initially to give people the benefit of the doubt, but at some point you may have to uh, modify uh, your assessment and behave accordingly. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be rude. That doesn't mean you have to say, get out of here. It just means, you know, listen, uh, I just say something like, you know, you have your opinion. Uh, that's not what I believe, but I can see that neither of us are going to convince the other, so there's not a lot of point in continuing the discussion. And, you know, that's about, that's about it. And that's, you know, sometimes you've got to do that. Yeah. Um, do you agree with the idea that if you treat your enemy with, like, a, a lot of respect, even maybe more than your friends in some cases, then you can turn them to your side, and if, if so, then what, in what cases would, like, generally would that not work? Yeah, so this is based on a, a pasuk in, again, in Mishlei, so we're, we're quoting pasukim in Mishlei today, as water reflects the face that you show the water, so the heart of man reflects that which you show it. The Vilna Gon explains, if I look at water, and it reflects back at me. Whatever face I show the water is the face I get back. I smile at the water, I see a smiling face. I frown at the water, I see a frowning face. So too, I show you love and concern and respect, you will mirror back to me love, concern, and respect. I show you disdain, that you're, you're nothing, you're gonna feel that way about me, right? That's a very important rule in human relations. Now, they tell a story about Rav Chaim Velazhener that uh, he once poskined in a dintaira against a certain butcher. He poskined that all of the butcher's meat is treif. And this, unfortunately, was a major financial loss. The butcher asked for a private meeting with Rav Chaim in the forest. Sounds bad already. Rav Chaim agreed. And when he came to the forest all alone, the butcher took out his meat cleaver and said, I'm going to kill you. You destroyed my business. And Rav Chaim closed his eyes and thought very hard for a, few, for a few seconds. And all of a sudden, the butcher threw down the meat cleaver and went on his knees and started crying and begged for forgiveness. What's the story? So there were Talmidim who, I guess, they were concerned for their Rebbe's safety, so they were standing from a certain distance, and they see this miracle. And they say, Rebbe, you're like a Hasidic Rebbe. You did miracles. He said, I didn't do any miracles. But I knew when my life was in danger, I had to think about the milus of this butcher. Like, what are the good things in his life? And I knew that if he felt the good vibes coming from me, he would feel good vibes towards me. So I tell people, do not try this at home. 
Uh, because it's not a game. It's not like you make, you know, you genuinely have to strive to see the Milas. So in truth, Shlomo Melech says it could work almost all the time. But in practice, you know, we can't rely on it that much because most of the time we don't have the, if we really dislike somebody, it's hard for us to genuinely feel that way. But I think it is possible. In fact, I remember reading a really quite a beautiful story uh, years ago how, uh, you know, the American Nazi party was censored in Omaha, Nebraska for some reason. That was the American Nazi party. And there was this American Nazi, you know, an American Nazi is not the same as a Nazi Nazi, but still, you know, you know, kill the Jews, get rid of the Jews. And he was a Jew hater and everything else. And at some point he had diabetes and he had a double amputation. We talked about double amputee. And there was like Chabad couple in the neighborhood and they decided they would try to take care of him and they would try to take him where he needed to go and he was pretty amazed he didn't want a Jew to even touch him but he had no choice he had no family and he let them do things and eventually he grew to love them and he said you know all of my Nazi friends when I stopped walking they kind of dropped me because I couldn't help them in their rallies or whatever it is and here you have these Jewish people. And my whole life I've been talking about, I want them to die. And when I was in trouble, they were there for me. And he actually said, I was just wrong. I just was wrong. So that's an interesting example, right? How you make your enemy into your friend. So it is, it is possible. It is possible. Yeah. I use another sentence. If someone makes a bracha on coffee when there was no milk, and then someone brings it to the outside later, and the person with the company wants to add, is it covered? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Now, it is clear, let, let, let's differentiate the situation, that if they wanted to drink a separate cup of milk, it's clear that the milk that was brought in later uh, would not be covered by the shahakol on the coffee, and they would have to make another bracha on the milk. That much is true because uh, their kavana was not on that milk, the milk was not in the house, it had to be brought uh, from outside. The question, though, becomes a harder question because the milk was added to the coffee under those circumstances. So here I would say this, I would say that the same principle about ikar and tafel, the main thing and the secondary thing, when it's two different brachas, you only make one bracha, I think would also apply if it's the same bracha, meaning given the fact that the milk is there, to essentially uh, sweeten the coffee or make the coffee easier to drink, so it would be covered by the shako. In other words, it wouldn't need its own shako because it's batel to the coffee. So as I would differentiate between the milk as a separate cup of milk versus milk that's added to the coffee. So I would not make a bracha there. Yeah? Was it for us, you are non Jews who were never exposed to the monotheistic beliefs, especially Judaism? Right, so the question is, uh, what is the Torah's view about non-Jews who were never exposed to monotheism, uh, certainly not Judaism, but even any monotheism, like Aztecs or, or, or the like? Of course, you could ask the same question about Jews who were not exposed, but okay. Uh, so this is the basic idea of what's called the Tinok Shanishba, quite literally, the baby that's captured. In this case, they were just raised in a society that didn't know God, uh, know God at all. So... There is a passage in the Rambam. Now, the Rambam's passage is about Jews, but I think you could extrapolate it to non-Jews as well, where the Rambam talks about the Karaites, the Karaim, uh, who didn't believe in the oral law, and uh, should they be condemned as heretics and, and the like. And the Rambam differentiates between the first Karaites who knew about Judaism and rejected it versus the kids who were raised in that environment. And the Rambam says, those who were raised in that environment uh, cannot be condemned, they cannot be blamed, and there's a mitzvah to try to be makar of them in different ways. Now, theoretically, that distinction could apply to Aztecs and, and, and Incas, uh, but on the other end, there are other passages in the Rambam that suggest that even if we can relate well to them, you know, we don't condemn them, but they're still not gonna go to Olam Haba because Monotheism is a necessary condition to that. And if you don't have the admission tickets, 
It doesn't make a difference why. So it would appear from a simple reading of the Rambam that uh, the Aztecs or the Incas, uh, you know, they haven't kept the Noahide law of, of, uh, of belief in God, uh, they would not have any paradise. Now, again, I don't think that means they would be punished. It could very well be that they don't deserve punishment because it's not their fault, but at the same time, they wouldn't go to Olam Haba, which means obliteration. They would die, and that's the, that's the end of it. So eternal damnation would not be appropriate, but you know, Olam Haba requires certain admission standards that you have to have. Yeah? Uh, speaking of the Aztecs, um, By the way, they were into human sacrifice too. That's a separate. That's a separate issue. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the Aztecs, um, according to Hazal, what is the origin of the Native American, you know, both South and North, maybe also Aboriginal Australians, and do they do those societies predate the flood? Yeah. 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 So, let me take the second question first. The notion of civilizations that predate the flood would of course rest on an assumption that not all human life was destroyed in the flood, right? Because you're saying there, besides Noah and his children, you're saying there may be pockets of humanity. And that seems to be contradicted by the Torah. The Torah seems to envision that all humanity, except for Noah and his uh, sons and his uh, daughters, uh, were destroyed. So if that's the case, then it must be that whether it's the Aborigines or whether it's the Incas or whether it's the Aztecs, they all came somehow from the 70 nations that were produced by Shem, Chum, and Yafes. That would be the assumption. So then the question would become, well, which of those nations are they connected to? Now, there was an old theory in the 19th century. We, we don't have a definitive uh, teaching of Chazal on this. But there was a very popular theory in the 19th century, both among Jews and Christian scholars, that at least the Native American Indian in the United States was from the 10 lost tribes of Israel. There was such a thing. And uh, whether that would apply to Aztecs or Incas, I, I don't even know if, if, if they said it for that. Uh, I think that's largely been discredited, but you know who knows? We just don't know. The lost 10 tribes were lost, right? So you, all sorts of things could have, uh, could have happened. Now, the, uh, and where did the Aborigines come from is also going to be difficult. On the other hand, uh, you know, the black nations came from Ham, so this could be a spin-off. How they got to Australia would be an interesting question, but that depends on how you date continental drift, meaning at one point all of these land masses were connected, and then they separated, right? So it's possible that the people in the Australian part just got separated. But the, the other thing to consider is this, and this is already a more radical, no hate mail, please, uh, and that is, are we mechuyev to believe that um, all human beings were destroyed in the flood? Now, there are opinions that say that the flood was not necessarily everywhere in the world. The flood was in the Middle East where, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, where Klal Yisrael would wind up living and the like. And maybe there were people in America and people in Australia and people in other places. Uh, which would actually mean, this is a radical idea, but it's theoretically a possible idea, that there were pockets of humanity that are not descended from Noah, and they go all the way back to Adam. So that would, in a sense, be a little easier to explain, but it would be more controversial. It, it, it is not the simple understanding of the narrative of the Torah. So there are some mysteries here. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the proper etiquette for people saying mourner's Kaddish, or Kaddish in general, because oftentimes you'll be in a shul and there's a few people saying it. One person might say it really loud and slow. Other people want to say it faster. They do it anyway, and then you have a bunch of people saying it at the wrong, the different rates, and when do we say amen or whatever? Like, does, is, it, is it proper for one person to kind of take over? And then part two of that would be, who says barfu at the end of Mariv? Um, is there like a <laughs> hierarchy or everyone just mentally like, okay, you're going to do yeah, that's a, that, 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 no. that's actually a hard one. <laughs> anyway, or who says uh, Kohanim when they could call the Kohanim to Jochen? Like, <laughs> you never know. Anyway, uh, so, so first of all, you understand that there is a very, very important machlokus in halacha whether multiple people should say the mourner's Kaddish at all. 
There are many, many poskim, and this is the minog in many Sephardish uh, kehilas, that only one person says the mourner's Kaddish, and there's a whole hierarchy, well, which, who's that, who that person should be. They take turns, or an avel in 12 months is, is, is under a yard site. In other words, there actually will be very, very detailed rules who gets to say each mourner's Kaddish. So many say that that is actually the better way of doing it, that you have only one person who says mourner's Kaddish at a time. Okay, but that's not our standard minog. The standard Ashkenazic minog even if it's not the original Ashkenazic minog, is all of the Avelim say Kaddish. Okay, so let's go with that because that's what we have. So the question then becomes a matter of, of, of etiquette. Now, obviously, just as a matter of common sense, the best thing to do is people should say it at the same pace. Now, that's not so hard, unless someone says it really fast. I mean, I, I've, been, I, I've sometimes had to say Kaddish, and I've been in a show where they just said it too fast. I, I, could, not ke- I could not keep up with, with uh, the speed <laughs> by which the person said Kaddish. You know? And I, I happen to know Kaddish by heart, right? But that didn't, it didn't help. So obviously, people have to moderate their speed. Not too fast, not too slow. But a problem is, if you're in different parts of the show, you don't always hear how the other people are doing it. So I've seen people, and I think it's a nice minog, that uh, they will gravitate. In other words, uh, if you have an ovel here, an ovel here, and an ovel here, the two will kind of gravitate to the one in the middle. And they'll be next to each other when they say Kaddish. That actually is a very nice thing to do. And uh, you try to have an intermediate pace. So uh, what can I tell you? But, but as I say, when you're dealing with a lot of people, you know, it's hard to coordinate and people do it their own way. Now, of course, another issue is Nusach, right? Ashkenazim and Sephardim have a different Nusach for Kaddish, right? So uh, right, Sephardim will say, or Hasidim will say, V'yatzmach porkanei v'karev mishichei, and then they have this thing at the end, Yehei Shlomo Rabbah a whole long, long, long thing. Uh, now, the halacha actually is, it's a funny thing, if you're davening in an Ashkenazic minion, a Sephardi is supposed to say Kaddish like an Ashkenazi. And if you're davening in a Sephardic minion, an Ashkenazi is supposed to say Kaddish like a Sephardi. Kaddish should follow the minhag of the minion. But that's absolutely not the way it's done. Uh, a Sephardic will always say a Sephardi Kaddish. An Ashkenazi will usually say an Ashkenazi Kaddish, although sometimes an Ashkenazi will tend to be more accommodating that way. So that's already a mistake. That already is absolutely a mistake. But okay, you know, you don't want to make machlokas and make too big of a deal of it. Uh, who says Borcha at the end? Uh, so, so it depends. Typically, uh, what it should be is the following. If you have two Avelim, two Avelim, and one Avel is davening Mayrev, the other Avel who will be saying Kaddish should be the one who says Baruch that, That's the basic rule. In other words, Baruch is a way of giving the Avel who didn't daven for the Amud a chalik of the tefillah. And that's the only rule. After that, if you don't have an Avel, there is no rule, whoever wants to say it. Uh, I, I would recommend, actually, that if there's no other Avel, the Chazan should say it. That, that's the most logical. There's, I mean, there's no particular reason why some guy from the crowd should say Baruch Baruch should be said by the Chazan unless there is another Avel, and this is his chance to participate in davening for the Omen. Is it an issue if multiple people say it at the same time? Baruch Yeah. No, only one person say Baruch But uh, if, if two people say it, you know, if they, no one decided who's going to do it whenever, and then two people say Baruch I mean, Well, uh, there may be one of them might, I mean, I don't, I don't know which one, but one of them may have said Hashem's name in vain. Oh, okay. Because it should only be recited by one person. Yeah. Well, uh, why is a woman puzzle hiatus? I mean, some of these are gzera sakasev. We don't necessarily know a reason. But one of the reasons that they give is that when it comes to edus, anyone that is kosher to testify has a chiyuv to testify. Meaning, if you are a kosher witness, you are obligated to go to Bastin. Now, the Torah did not want to obligate women to go to Bastin because sometimes a woman has responsibilities with children. So if you're not going to make her obligated, you have to say she's disqualified. 
That would be one svara. The other svara, which again, maybe people get offended today when you make generalizations, uh, is that uh, women uh, might be guided by emotion more than reason, and as a result, they may either have too much compassion for somebody, or else if they feel he's a bad person, they may be overly strict, and therefore there is an issue of objectivity and the like. Uh, but ultimately, these are Gezeris Arkasas. We don't really know uh, the reason, Legamre. Uh, yeah? How does Bo reconcile artifacts that, that, they, that carbon date the 10,000 years ago that humans supposedly made? Yeah, so uh, the issue is carbon dating, which can uh, establish a certain uh, year, right? That this is based on the deterioration rate of, of radioactivity and the half-life and everything else. We can say that something is 50,000 years old or 100,000 years old or even a million years old if you're talking about uh, fossils and the like. And how do you reconcile that with the fact that, uh, see, age of the Earth is not the same problem. Age of the Earth being billions of years, that we have a lot of answers, that there were prior worlds, etc. But when you're talking about the age of man, that is a little more complicated because even with all of the interpretations regarding age of the Earth, we do say that Adam Harishain is only 5,783, and carbon dating can show me, you know, 10,000, 100, or 50,000, I'll say 100,000 years old. I don't think much more than that. So how do you reconcile that? So there are uh, a few possibilities. Uh, one is the famous theory that was advanced actually by Christian scholars in the 19th century, but was revived by Rabbi Avigdor Miller and Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, for that matter, and that's called the old earth theory. And that is to say that when God created the earth, the world, he created things having a certain age. For example, he created redwood trees. Now let's imagine you would be on earth one second after God created a redwood. If you were to then cut that tree and count the rings, you would have a tree that's 500 years old. In other words, God created things having an age so as a result, carbon dating can simply be the measurement of how old it was when it was created, but not really how old it actually, actually was. That would be one idea. Uh, the other idea is that the flood disrupted uh, radiation rates, and therefore the extrapolation from the present rate of deterioration to assume that that was a constant, because carbon dating is based on a constancy. Of, of, of a deterioration, and if the marble like changed everything, so Bichlal, it throws off the whole, the whole measuring system. How does old earth um, answer, how does that answer if humans made something? No, no, because what I'm saying is that the dating process itself is not accurate, meaning, yeah, humans made it, and carbon dating shows it's 100,000 years old, but the dating could be off. Maybe it's only 4,000 years old. In other words, the dating got shifted. In other words, once you undermine the accuracy of the measurement, then you don't have any question whatsoever. Yeah? Um, how are we supposed to deal with uh, reform converts who think that they're Jewish but they're not actually Jewish? How is a reform person supposed to interact with them and should they, and how can they let them know that they're not Jewish? Well, like, like always, if you have a reform convert who's not halachically Jewish, most of the time they're not halachically Jewish, um, how do you relate to them? Well, like always, like all, to all human beings, unless they're deliberately trying to destroy Judaism, you try to be nice to them, derech eretz, and the fact that they're interested in Judaism is a plus. Uh, so it depends on where they're holding. If they're interested in Judaism and Jewish learning, you can find a way to say, well, listen, it's great that you studied and you reached a certain level, but you should know that you're not going to be, first of all, a lot of reform know that anyway, you're not going to be totally accepted. Would you like to explore? You would be allowed to encourage them, meaning even though we normally don't encourage a goy to become Jewish, once somebody has gone as far as a reform conversion, at that point you can encourage them. So you can actually encourage them to come to Eishat Torah, come to Or Sameach, uh, come to some yeshiva, uh, learn with them, and see where it takes you, you know, at that point. So, uh, you know, you do it gently, and you do it just say, you know, you don't even have to say, uh, I don't regard you as Jewish. You can say that. A lot of movements would not regard you as Jewish, etc., and see where that takes, and be encouraging. Yeah. So, 
wanted to smell that, would you have to, or are you, are you allowed to take vodka? And after you do it, would you allowed to drink that after? Yes, so the general, the general rule is that things that are used primarily for food or drink, you don't make the, uh, the aromatic bracha on. So when it's in the form of arak, uh, you would not make a bracha on that. Uh, it has to be like separate seeds that, not, that you don't commonly eat. Okay, so you would not make the bracha there. Um, I, I, I'll check it. I don't want to. I don't want to say it was wrong, but I, I believe it was not correct because the coffee is not made for reyach. It is made for shesia, for you know cooking. So I, I don't believe you'd make a bracha on ground coffee. Well, no, it's, it doesn't make it usher. <laughs> he could still make it into coffee, but but I think the other way around. Since it is coffee for drink, uh, you don't make a, a reyach bracha on it. When we recite Shira in Shacharis, yeah, there's a there's a, a pasuk as Hashem Yimloch Lo Boed, and then we say it again, and then we say it in Aramaic. Why do we why do we interrupt the Shira seemingly to say it, the same thing twice and then the same thing in Aramaic when it doesn't say that in the Pumas? You know, it's it's very very interesting that some posts can say that that's a mistake. Let me explain why. Uh, in Uval Litziyin that we say at the end of Davening. That we actually have what's called a kedusha. Right? There's, there, there's a we say kedusha three times in chakras. We say kedusha in birchos kriyashma. We say kedusha in chazara sashats, and we say kedusha in uvalit siyin. Now, in uvalit siyin, after every pasuk of kedusha, there are three psukim, right? There's uh, kadosh, 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 uh, baruch kvod Hashem mimkomo. And Yimlo Hashem right? Uh, Hashem Yimlo Hashem Yimlo Chlo Now there, every time we say the pasuk, we say the Aramaic, because Chazal wanted in the last kedusha you're going to say, when you sanctify God, we wanted everybody. You see, Aramaic was the common language. We want everybody to understand what we're doing. So this is called kedusha de sidra. This is the kedusha of the arrangement at the end of davening. So some have said the Hashem Yimloch Lovet Hashem Malchusei Kaim Lamamaya is simply like almost like a gut reaction that when we said Hashem Yimloch Lovet in the Kedusha de Sidra we had a targum, so they put the targum in Az Yashir, when in fact uh, there's no reason to do it there. You see what I'm saying? In other words, they're following the pattern of the Kedusha de Sidra. Uh, so some say it's a mistake. Some say it's a mistake. Others say uh, we look at it like a fourth opportunity to say a partial kedusha. I'll give you an example where we see a very similar thing. Uh, in Havdalah, when we reach the pasuk la Yehudim Haisa Ora v'Simcha v'Sasain v'Kor Kain Tialano, so everybody says it out loud. Everyone says that pasuk out loud. So people ask. Where, what is the makor of saying that pasuk out loud? The, the answer is, I, I, again, I don't want to say 100% because there, there could always be makoras, but as far as I know, there is no makor for saying out, out loud. So why do we say it out loud? Because la Yehudim haisa oira v'simcha is a pasuk in Megillas Esther. And when we read it in Megillas Esther, the minog is to say it out loud. So, this might be a minute that somebody just started so, somewhere, and that is, oh, when you see the words like Hidim Isa Ori, you say it out loud like we do on Purim. But in fact, it's very different. So some say that that's exactly what happened in the Oz Yashir, in which the Hashem Yimelech Olam Voyed was taken from the Kedusha de Sidra and had the Targum. So some, some do not say it. Some do not say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you if you if you would go through <laughs> if you would go through Shas and read every page of the Masifta, yeah, you would be <laughs> you would know you would know quite a lot. There's an enormous amount of information there. You know, here's the thing: people get wrong. I think you know, people will say, "Oh no, you can only be a Talmud Chacham if you work to understand Torah." 
Now, that's 100% true. You have to work. But do you think reading through the Masifta doesn't take work? I mean, it's not like, oh, Masifta is like a nice, like reading a comic book, you know, all really, really simple stuff. When you have to read an Achron, you have to work. So, so, so the Taina, oh, the Masifta doesn't uh, takes away work. You know, that, that's just not, that's just false. So certainly, if a person really tried to understand what they were reading, then the Ezra Hashem, there would certainly be a Talmud Chacham. Right, a right. Grave. Um, and I remember hearing that some people say it should be four almost away, when even if you want to, let's say, kill him in front of the grave. Um, but, and the reason why I, so I remember hearing is because it's like, uh, it's like, uh, like it's, uh, like make, uh, embarrassing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, my question is, why would I not be allowed to say to kill him? Right. So, so actually, we, we we quite literally we're we're talking about this uh, in the in the center in the uh, in the in the morning in the morning share the afternoon share. Uh, this is called loeg larush, making fun of a poor person, and the Gemara it's a Gemara in Brachos. The Gemara in Brachos says you don't wear your tefillin within four amos of a mace. You don't wear your tzitzes out within four amos of a mace because since the mace is no longer able to do these mitzvos. They feel you're mocking them, you're making fun of them, you're giving them pain, and therefore you cover it up. This is called Loe Glarush, and you know, we talked about that. Uh, now, some say that Tehillim or Davening in, uh, for, for the Mace's benefit is not Loe Glarush, you're honoring the Mace, and they consider it Mutter. Other people say that even Tehillim should be four Amos away. So your question is, well, even dead neshamos praise God. That's what they do. What do you do in Shemayim? You praise Hashem. So, Enochinami, I understand a dead person does not put on tefillin, does not wear tzitzis, does not you know, learn Torah the way we learn Torah. Okay, but praising Hashem, l'chara, they do. So, what is the making fun you know, uh, of, of them? Uh, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, I guess maybe the assumption would be this, that one who can praise God, although they have a yetzer hara, is a qualitatively higher level than one who praises God without a yetzer hara. So maybe the loig larash is, oh, you're so great because you still have the yetzer hara that you're struggling with, and you conquer it and you praise God, as opposed to me, I just do what I'm programmed to do. So it could be that that, that, that itself makes it low equal rush. Yeah? Can you bring uh, the written word Yisrael into the bathroom? Because it has... Because it has God's name in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, halacha, you can, because just as we pronounce right, Yisrael, we don't say Yisrakel. Mm -hmm. So once it's part of a name, even though it does have God's meaning, it's no longer considered a name of God. I mean, more specifically, I have a necklace with the Shema written on it, but without, it's two Yuds instead of Hashem's name, then El King is spelled differently. Yeah, so th that, that, okay, well, even then, I think Mi'ikara dinner would be mutter, but, but the best thing to do is to cover it with a double covering. So if, for example, you're wearing a shirt and an undershirt, mm -hmm. or a sweater and a shirt, just put it behind the second, the, se the one, you know, so it has two separations. S undershirt shirt or shirt and sweater and that would be that would be good but so just cover it up that way by the way somebody showed me this is the strangest thing i think new zealand's currency or new zealand coin and it has a tree and under it is yud k vav k in in hebrew hebrew letters shame hamaforish mamish new zealand coin go figure uh so you can keep the coin, but again, in terms of, well, does it have Kedusha? That's an interesting question. In other words, I was going to say, you can't bring it into the bathroom, but some say, actually we pass in this way, that a name of Hashem that's written by a non-Jew does not have the holiness of God's name. So that actually might not be a, a, a problem. Yeah? Um, I, how can one appreciate Shabbos 
in a more rationalistic uh, way? And also, how do we define the beautiful shabbos? Well, the truth of the matter is, I mean, um, I remember uh, in the 1960s, uh, William Buckley, famous, famous conservative, was running for mayor of New York. And uh, it was really a protest. He knew he wouldn't win. In fact, he was asked, what is the first thing you're going to do if you win the election? He said, demand a recount. He didn't, he didn't expect to win at all. But, and of course, he didn't win. Uh, but one of his radical proposals, and Buckley is a Catholic. Buckley is as Goyish as you could get. Uh, Connecticut, you know, whatever. And uh, Buckley advocated like a Saturday in which there's no traffic in the city and just peace and everything else. Basically, he was calling for Shabbos. So the truth is, Shabbos is very easy to sell, even as a secular idea because it's a day in which we disattach ourselves, disconnect ourselves from technology, in which we emphasize being with our families, in which we enjoy nature, we think about God, we think about uh, what is our lives about. I think in a, in a world where people have to be on social media like 24 hours a day, this can make a real, real significant difference in his life. In many, many ways, I think Shabbos might be an easier sell than it was in a less and technical like time. The service to Hashem that we're in, that we're no, so the service to God is, uh, well, it is service to God, but the idea is that um, you think about your life. This is a time in which instead of, you know, you're running in this rat race that never stops, you think about what is my life about? Why am I working? What am I trying to accomplish? Where do I want to go? What type of children do I want to have? And Shabbos is the time you can think about that. And that's a very, very beautiful thing for people. In fact, it's interesting that uh, people don't realize, you know, we're so used to the ancient world hating Jews, right? Greece and Babylonia, you know, they hated Jews. But it's interesting, there was a lot of, uh, in, Roman, in the Roman Empire, there was a lot of philo-Semitism. I wouldn't say it was the majority, but there were quite a few uh, Roman writers who admired Jews. They admired Jews. And one of the things they admired most about Jews was the idea of Shabbos, the idea that they have this one day a week where they focus on their own spiritual lives. And many, many non-Jewish Romans admired that idea of Shabbos. So it did have a, a powerful influence even in the <coughs> hostile cultures. Yeah. Why are there so many sages in the Talmud who are named with a variant of the word Rav? such as Rava, Rabba, Rab, Ravina, Ravin, Ravnai, etc. Yeah, yeah, so the, so the answer is, is, is actually very simple. Uh, the Rav is not part of their name. I mean, let's say Ravina. Ravina is a contraction, Rav Avina. Mm. So what happened was, in the course of copying over the years, they dropped the Aleph. Mm. Rava is actually Rav Abba. Rava's name was Abba. So it wasn't, the, the Reish was not part of the name itself. Oh, let me, let me, yeah, 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 first, yeah, yeah. I saw written in a book from Abraham Joseph. Yeah, yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It says that he's supposed to have the one to protect the miracle and the mitzvahs and still remain devoted to spirituality. And still remain? Devoted to spirituality. Yes. Yeah. How is that? Well, th 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 this is not his yesod. This is a famous yesod of Ramban. Uh, Ramban says. Oh, Ramban. Huh? Oh, oh, he quotes the Ramban. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he quotes the Ramban. Yeah, very good. This is the Ramban on Kedoshim Tiyu. There's a mitzvah to be holy. So the Ramban says, what is the Torah adding? A mitzvah to be holy. What is that mitzvah? So he says that it's possible for a person to keep the commandments, but he could still be a novel b'rshus Torah. That means a disgusting person with the Torah's permission in terms of his midos, in terms of his behavior, and the like. So Kedoshim Tiyu says, don't be a disgusting person within the bounds of the law. So you're asking, uh, how would that be possible? Meaning, how would it be possible that a person keeps the mitzvahs, but is still uh, not, uh, what was the language that he used? Still not connect or devoid of spirituality. Yeah, well, the short, I mean, again, there are a lot of different ways. It's not a, it's not, it's not a single answer. But one way is, you do things mechanically, without thinking about them, without feeling. You, you know, we even use the expression, and it's a chaval that we use the expression, daven something up. 
I mean, think about it. You know, we say, you know, we criticize the way somebody learns. Oh, you're davening up the duff. Which means, in other words, we're using davening as the example of superficial activity without thought. And it's so accepted that that's the way davening is that we use it as an expression for other things. That's pretty sad. I mean, for Kerr, davening up should mean, oh, I think about it. Yeah. So, so superficiality is a big thing. Not thinking about it is a big thing. Uh, not feeling love of Hashem or yiras Hashem, which the Zohar says are the wings that bring your mitzvahs up to Shemayim. So in all of these ways, you know, you're technically keeping everything. But it's like a goof without a neshama. It's a body without a, without a soul. No, no. So, so maybe uh, the Ramban didn't use, uh, you see, that's Rabbi Tversky's paraphrase a little bit. The Ramban didn't say it's worthless. It's not worthless. But it means that it's still a disgusting thing. It's not a good thing. It's better to do it than not to do it. But it's, you know, it's an empty thing and it doesn't have, its, it doesn't have the spirituality that it should have. And that's called Novo, Novo Birsha Satola. Yeah? Um, would a, so if you're in uh, a ghost town on Shabbos, would I get my uh, 2,000 Amos to walk around? And another, another variation is, uh, let's say there's, you know, on, during the week, there's like a financial district and people are in the building during the week. But, uh, you know, during Shabbos, everyone goes home, so there's no, there's no people there during Shabbos. Would that... Would that count as part of the city that's extended? Yeah, yeah. So those are interesting questions about Tuchum Shabbos, right? You're not allowed to go more than 2,000 amos from your residence on Shabbos, which is not that much. It's only a kilometer uh, or so, like 4,000 feet. And if you stepped even one inch out, you are frozen in a radius of four amos for all of Shabbos, unless it's a sakana or something like that. So uh, on the other hand, uh, we know that as long as you have continuous houses within a certain distance, so the 2,000 amos don't start till you reach like the last house for that distance. So you ask two questions. One is, well, what if there's plenty of houses, but it's abandoned? It is a, go uh, a ghost town, of which there used to be uh, you know, plenty. There, in the West, throughout the Western United States, there were plenty of abandoned towns when the gold mines dried up or, or whatever it is. So I would say this, if nobody lives there at all, if they're totally abandoned, they don't count, and you only have 2,000 namas from your house. On the other hand, when you're dealing with a business district in which these are functioning places where people go, the fact that nobody's there on Shabbos uh, does not deprive them as either residences or business offices. And therefore, you'd be able to keep on walking. So you could walk through midtown Manhattan, uh, even though it seems to be pretty ghost town. Right? In fact, that's a great thing. New York City, uh, Sunday morning, is actually very, very nice. You can drive all over Manhattan and uh, you, know, you don't have any traffic. Yeah. How do we define Kedusha's Shabbos? Well, Kedusha Shabbos means the ability to feel closeness to Hashem. Hashem makes himself more accessible on Shabbos. Now, that doesn't mean you will feel it, because you've got to prepare for it, but it means potentially Hashem is there and you're able to open your heart more. Now, when Chazal have a famous saying, he who prepares on Erev Shabbos will eat on Shabbos, that it is true about the food. Either you either cook the food or buy the food or get yourself an invitation, right? If you don't do that on Erev Shabbos, you won't have what to eat. That's true. But there's something much more than food. There's mazon ruchni, spiritual food, connecting to Hashem, soul food. And Misha Mechen be Erev Shabbos. You got to prepare the soul food on Erev Shabbos. You can't expect just to go into Shabbos and you'll feel everything. You got to prepare ahead of time, right? So that's, uh, that's why uh, you need the Hakana. Yeah. So if uh, Hashem's name doesn't have Kedusha if it's written by Gore, yeah. can you get, I mean, obviously it's probably going to touch you, but if you got. A tattoo of Hashem's name on you from Goy, can you erase it? So that, 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 that's exactly the issue. That, that's where the question comes up. People sometimes get tattoos, which, you know, is wrong anyway, but they got a tattoo when, when, before they were religious. And to compound the problem, it's sometimes the name of God, sometimes Mamish Yud Kei Vav Kei. There's an Isser Dioraisa to eradicate uh, the name of Hashem. 
So the question is, a person is a Baal Shuva, they may want to get rid of a tattoo. They don't have to, by the way, but, but generally they might want to get rid of the tattoo. But if it's God's name, you know, what do you do? So those who say there's no holiness if it's done by a guy would allow you to remove the tattoo. That, that, that's exactly where it comes up. Yeah? No, that is not. Uh, I learned Torah not to feel empty. Uh, that's Torah Shalom Lishma, which is still good. Mitoch Shalom Lishma, you come Lishma. But that would not be Torah, Torah Lishma. Torah Lishma is when you learn it to, well, well there are different definitions. The great Rav Chaim of Olajan, Torah Lishma just means I learn it in order to understand the Torah. I want to understand Hashem's Torah. According to other opinions, Torah Lishma is I learn it to have a relationship with Hashem. According to a third interpretation, I learn it to be able to know how to do the mitzvahs. Because that would depend on what you're learning. So there are different definitions. But if I learn it because I don't, I don't want to feel depressed, again, I'm, I'm not disparaging that. Uh, that's a legitimate shalol lishma, which is mitoch shalol lishma ba lishma, but technically I don't think it would be Torah lishma. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, one more question? Yeah, yeah one yeah. last question. Yeah. Uh, someone brought up to me that uh, there's that some people posting that if you're not in a good mood, you don't have to daven at that particular point, and you're rid of this, <laughs> uh, and what are the parameters where that would apply? No, no, that wouldn't apply today. Uh, at a time, at a time when people were capable of full kavana, there was a concept that when you weren't capable of full kavana, you were putter because you couldn't do as good a job as you normally could. But today, it's brought down that since our kavana is always weak, we can't use these as extenuating circumstances. Okay, be well. Have a good uh, good Shabbos. Good week.